Hello and welcome to the first episode of The Gym Buster, the video blog where I'm determined to find the truth no matter how ugly it is. Throughout the series I'll be investigating the bro sciences and trying to sort out the truths from the fiction using evidence and reasoning. Today's subject is the hamstrings roll during a back squat. It's not difficult to find examples online where people recommend doing a back squat for strengthening the hamstrings. This is something I keep on encountering and that I've always wanted to discuss. It's common knowledge that the back squat's primary move is at the quadriceps, the glutes, and the lower back. So I am always skeptical whenever someone suggests that an antagonist is also being worked during an isotonic movement. But before we get into it, we need to discuss the basic language and definitions in resistance training. Please note that this series is designed for beginners, and by that I mean people who are just starting out in the gym, or people who have been working out for several months and they don't know what or who to believe. The more advanced gym goers should hopefully already know these things and may not get as much out of these videos as the beginners. So, having said that, let's define the language and definitions before we jump into the science. So, talking about the back squat, we are moving several joints through a range of motion. These joints include the knee and hip primarily, as seen on the left. There may be a bit of ankle and or lower back movement, but for our intents and purposes, we do not need to go there today. When a movement utilizes several joints, such as the back squat, it is called a compound movement. An example of a non-compound or single joint movement would be a seated leg curl, as seen on the right, where only the knee joint is being flexed or moved. The muscles doing most of the lifting or moving are called the agonists. They are the most important role. These are the muscles we're trying to strengthen during the movement. The opposing muscles are called the antagonists. Just like in the movies, the antagonists are opposing the main character. If these muscles were activated, we would have the opposite movement happen. When we're moving something with the body, it is usually referred to as an isotonic movement or isotonic contraction. This means as we move a limb, the main muscles involved are shortening or pulling on the bones to create a certain movement, such as seen on the left where the biceps are shortening to create a lifting of the dumbbell. Sometimes when we exert force, there is no movement, such as in holding a plank as seen on the right, or stiffening up on a roller coaster when we're about to go around a tight bend. These kinds of muscular contractions are called isometric and do not create movement. Our body contains both single joint and multi-joint muscles. What this means is that some muscles span across only one joint. For example, the vasti muscles in your thigh only span across your knee joint. So when they contract, your knee straightens, or you could say that your knee extends as seen on the left. Some muscles affect several joints when they contract. An example of a multi-joint muscle is the biceps brachii as seen on the right, as this muscle spans across both the shoulder and the elbow joint. So when the biceps brachii contracts, your shoulder would flex and come up slightly, and simultaneously your elbow would flex. So when a multi-joint muscle contracts, we have several joints moving. An important thing to know about muscles is that they only have one action, and that is to contract. We can, however, control how strongly they contract, or control how much force they're exerting on our bones during a contraction. When a muscle is contracting, it is not working harder at one end than it is at the other. This force is distributed evenly across all of the bridges which make up the muscle. For example, if you are holding a dumbbell and curling it from a full hang by your side up to a 90 degree flexion, this is a 50% range of motion for your elbow. This would not mean that you're only working the bottom half of your biceps. It would actually mean that all of the bridges in your biceps were working at 50% contraction. The bridges I'm referring to are the actin and myosin bridges which execute the muscle contraction. This is a topic for another video. Finally, during a movement where we move a weight in one direction then back again, there are typically two phases. The concentric phase and the eccentric phase. The concentric phase is where the muscles we are wanting to work are contracting and shortening, usually against resistance. So in a bench press, the concentric phase would be when we have the bar near our chest and are trying to push it up. During this movement, the pectoralis major, shoulder and triceps are working very hard, contracting to get the bar up off our chest. The eccentric phase would be then when we are lowering the bar from up high to down near our chest. What's important to know here is that during the eccentric phase, we are using the same muscles as when we lifted the bar. So when you contract your pecs and triceps to get the bar up high, all you're doing to lower the bar is to steadily decrease the involvement of your pecs and triceps. Another analogy is as if you had a volume knob that was attached to your pecs and triceps to control their strength output. Firstly, as in the top picture, lowering the bar, you would be turning the knob from maybe a 5 down to a 2. 
Then to lift the bar, you'll be turning it from a 2 up to a 7 if you wanted to sort of push through the concentric phase that little bit more. I have heard some people say that they think their biceps are pulling the bar down to their chest in the bench press, and this is just not the case. Gravity is assisting in lowering the bar down, as it does in most eccentric phases, and all we need to do is use the same lifting muscles to control the movement down. If we were to use our biceps in the bench press to lower it, we could seriously crush our rib cage. But enough of this, let's get on to the fun stuff, the science. So during a compound movement such as the back squat, we have many muscles involved in different phases. During the initial lowering or eccentric phase, the glutes are acting on the hip joint, the lower back muscles are keeping the back locked straight, hopefully, and the quadriceps are acting on the knee joint. The adductor or inner thigh muscles are also acting to keep the knees drawn in, as the knees tend to go out during a squat. And these are the primary movements. Looking at the hamstrings now, all of the hamstrings except for the short head of biceps femoris are multi-joint muscles. They span from the hip bone to the tibia and or fibula, meaning they span multiple joints, both across the hip and knee joint. When the hamstrings contract, you get your thigh coming back towards your bum and your knee joint flexing. It would be a great position for kicking a ball on the ground. Anatomically, however, the hamstrings are simply unable to do both these movements during a squat. Let's discuss this further. During the concentric or lifting phase of the squat, we are extending the hip joint, which is one roll of the hamstrings, but we are also extending the knee joint, which actually stretches the hamstrings further out. So while standing back up during the squat, we have the hamstrings wanting to shorten up near the hip, but they cannot do this because they are being stretched at the knee. The key is that this is happening simultaneously. If we were to lock the knees and extend the hips, or vice versa, it would be a different story. Another way of putting this is that the hamstring's length stays the same throughout the squat and is unable to contract significantly. But what does the actual research say about all this? One man by the name of Per Tesh is a professor in physiology at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. He has published over 130 research papers and is considered an expert in the strength training field. He conducted magnetic resonance imaging studies for one of his books called Target Bodybuilding back in 1999 to find accurate measures of which muscles were actually involved during common lifts. Like any form of measurement, MRI does have its limitations, however it allows us to look deeper than electromyography EMG, which can often make it hard to distinguish between which muscle groups are actually contracting, especially when we are wanting to observe a deep muscle which is underneath other muscles. For the back squat, Per found that, as we thought, the hamstrings are not contributing to the squat in any significant way. Please refer to this slide and pause the video if you want to take a better look. Another piece of research is the article Hamstring Activation During Lower Body Resistance Training Exercises published by Eben in the International Journal of Sports Physiology and Performance in 2009. This study found, using EMG, that a back squat elicited on average only about 25% of the hamstring's maximum voluntary contraction. This is the most weight a muscle or muscles can possibly move. However, the quadriceps were working at around 270% the effort of the hamstrings during a back squat, so it is very obvious which muscle group is the agonist here and which is not. The most interesting discovery during the study was that a Russian curl, also known as a Nordic curl, elicited an incredible 95% maximum voluntary contraction from the hamstrings. That is phenomenal! So one could say that the Russian curl is 280% more effective than the squat for working the hamstrings. It is this blogger's opinion that if they are active during a back squat, it is at a level of significance to at least not be classified as a prime mover or even as a synergist. If anything, the hamstrings are most likely to be isometrically activated to provide knee and or hip stability. As they are not physically able to shorten during the back squat, they can still tighten up and act isometrically. Isometric activations can still elicit reasonable outputs in muscle activation like we've seen. However, muscles respond the most to being put through a large range of motion. This will be the subject of another video. So from these two studies, it is safe to conclude that the back squat is not an effective hamstring exercise and that there are plenty of better ways to work them. So, how do we activate or work the hamstrings? Let's take a look. Well, now that we know the hamstrings provide knee flexion and hip extension, we can approach the problem in two ways. We can either try to activate both of these movements simultaneously, but practically this is a bit awkward and difficult to add weight to. So, an alternative would be to either lock the hip or the knee joint and work the other. For example, a leg curl, as seen on the left, 
which locks the hip joint and allows us to work the hamstrings at the knee joint. By locking one of these joints, we literally take it out of the equation. The study by Eben found that the leg curl and Russian curl, as seen on the right, these movements were more effective for hamstring activation than stiff-legged deadlift or leg curl. This is most likely due to the glutes also being involved in hip extension, whereas knee flexion only involves the hamstrings. So I hope this video has helped you in some way, and I want to thank you for watching. Keep moving, and don't believe everything that you hear.